Well, we are excited you're with us at the Ransom Church. Welcome to week three of a series that we're just calling More. And the heart of this series that we're diving into is this idea that each of us has a personal calling, that there is more in you than you want to believe, and that there's more that God wants to do through you than you could possibly ever imagine. And so today I want to set up our topic with a story. I don't know if, if, if you need this, but when I'm unpacking scripture, a lot of times if I can attach that truth to a story, it's helpful. Uh, so did anyone here, when you were growing up, or maybe this is still true of you, you have a stuffed animal that you just really, really loved, okay? When you were, I love that that got an amen, by the way. Uh, when you were kids, uh, when, we, my, when we were little kids, my, my parents gave us a stuffed animal. I think it was for Christmas one year or something. Uh, my little sister, who's 10 months younger than me, and myself, uh, we each got one of these for Christmas. Uh, mine was like this seafoam green, and Tina, my sister, hers was pink. And I played with my stuffed animal a little bit, and then I kind of forgot about it, but Tina fell in love with hers hard. It was this giant pink stuffed poodle, and she has such fond memories of it. I, this is how she remembers it, okay? That's, now, when you love something, you see it in your mind a certain way, and you think, man, this is, this is great. This is how I remember, she remembered, that's how I remember it, right there, right? <laughs> So we don't have the same recollection of this ugly poodle, but, but uh, there's nowhere that Tina went without this poodle. And Tina named this poodle, first name, Bobo, last name, Poochie Pooch. That's right, Bobo Poochie Pooch. And Tina never went anywhere without Bobo. In fact, I, 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 these, are not, these pictures that I showed are not real pictures. We couldn't find a real picture of Bobo. We look back, uh, but even as I asked my sister, can you send me a picture of Bobo? As a 40-year-old, my sister was like, oh, Bobo was awesome. Bobo was the best. And she started to go on and she started to remember, oh, I miss Bobo. And she's, she's 40 years old, right? But he, after a while of, of her dragging Bobo around everywhere, he got a little dirty, he got a little faded, he got a little raggedy. I think at one point he lost one of his eyes. She drug this thing around so long that eventually all of the stuffing fell out. She was basically just dragging around a dog corpse, right? That's all it was. And so, but Tina never stopped loving Bobo. She never stopped loving Bobo. Now, I don't recall Bobo's ultimate demise. Okay, I don't know how Bobo died, but I know this. No pink poodle was ever loved more than Bobo. Now, why do I tell that story? I tell that story because it's a perfect way to illustrate our topic for today. I want to focus our attention today on a love that God seems to have for Bobos like us. Flawed and broken, bent and tattered by life, but made beautiful, made beautiful by his unconditional love. That is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. First, that God loved us in our brokenness, that he sees the masterpiece in our mess, as we talked about a few weeks ago. But not only that, that he loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, and that Jesus actually made a way for our salvation through his willingness to be broken in our place. That's what we just remembered as we celebrated communion together. And I want to spend some time shining a light on this amazing love that God has for us. So turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, Paul uh, was writing this as a prisoner of the state. Uh, he is in chains because he refused to remain quiet. He cannot help but share about Jesus Christ, and he's paying for his allegiance to Jesus with imprisonment. Okay? But as we read this letter, he has no, there's no signs of regret. Neither is he even cautious about what he's writing. In fact, he's so driven by his passion for God that he writes a letter about God's love for us from prison where he's being held for talking about God's love for us, okay? Now, I would like to say I had that level of passion, and maybe sometimes I do, but here's something you need to understand about Paul. Paul knew the power of being loved by God. Paul was a hater of Jesus, 
and a hater of his followers. He was a persecutor of Christians. When Stephen became the first believer to be martyred or to be killed for his faith in Jesus Christ, Paul, who was then known as Saul, was standing there holding the coats. He, he was in it, okay? And when God got a hold of Saul on the side of the road, he was on his way to arrest more Christians. There was nothing for God to love about Saul. And yet God loved him in spite of himself. It was a love that didn't seem to make sense. It was a love for someone that didn't seem worth loving. And yet still he fiercely, fiercely loved Paul enough to reach down and to meet him where he was. And by the way, maybe that's where you are today. Listen, one of the greatest lies that the enemy wants to tell you is this. God could never love you because of what you've done because of who you are, because of the mistakes that you've made. His grace obviously can extend to other people, but it doesn't extend to you. You're too broken. You're too beat up. You're too ragged. You're too dirty. And yet God has proven again and again and again that he loves you with such a reckless love that it changes everything. Paul was so changed by that love that his life would never, ever be the same. And so Paul, his letter to the Ephesians is proclaiming that love. We, we begin in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, says this, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. This is the beauty of unconditional love. But what I want you to see as we dive in today is a calling on your life in the same way That God loves us, loves me, loves you unconditionally. His expectation is that his love would so change us and so affect us that it actually changes the way that we love others. In the last few weeks, we talked about how you are more. You are made to be more than you think. You are made to do more than you can imagine. Today, I want to proclaim another truth to you. You are made to love more. And let me illustrate what I mean with a question. When Jesus died on the cross, who did he die for? Did did he die just for those who he knew would choose him? Did he die just for the Jewish people? Or did he die for everyone? Who did he die for, right? Well, this is one of the great struggles with God's grace. It's human nature to assume that God died, that Jesus died for the good people. It's harder to imagine that Jesus died for the bad people, at least as we define good or bad. Now, the Jews at the time would have assumed that God's love was limited to to the Jewish people. After all, they were his people. He was, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. They were the chosen people. So that's, of course, who Jesus died for is the Jews, right? And yet, as we read Paul's letter, look at what Paul writes in in Ephesians 3, starting with verse 1. Paul says, when I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the benefit of you Gentiles. Now, that's actually why Paul was in jail, (laughs) He says, for the benefit of you Gentiles, a Gentile is a non-Jewish person. A Gentile is an outsider. Paul had been arrested for ministering, not to the Jews, but to the outsiders, for taking a stand for the equality of the outsider. The Jews were unwilling to believe God's love could extend to anyone who wasn't like them. By the way, have we ever been guilty of that? And Paul had actually been one of these Jews himself. So what changed? Well, we see it in verse 1. He says, when I think of all this, or literally, for this reason. And the reason Paul's talking about is everything that came before. It's God's unconditional love for him. Paul says, listen, when I think about who I was, when I think about how I was living, and when I think about how God loved me in spite of my brokenness when there was nothing worth loving, it helps me realize just how big God's love must be. God's love cannot be limited to the Jews. God's love is more. Now, at this point, Paul loses his train of thought. He's like, squirrel, you know. So verse 1, he's making a point. He doesn't come back to it until verse 14. He goes on a 12-verse kind of right turn, and we're going to follow him on that rabbit trail. Look at verse 2 and 3. He says, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. Most people had heard about Paul's ministry by now, but most people would not have understood because Gentiles had always been outsiders. There was no place for them in God's love. 
And yet, what Paul was claiming is that God's love extended to those considered outsiders. The, the word special responsibility here literally translates stewardship. In other words, Paul is saying, God made me a steward of his love. I'm responsible for extending the reach of his love. I'm responsible for loving more. And he calls this plan a mystery, and certainly it would have seemed mysterious or at very least strange to the Jews because the, he, the Messiah was the Jewish Savior. Why in the world would he die for non-Jews? Why would he die for Gentiles? And again, please hear me. It's easy to assume, isn't it, that God's love is for us? But often it's, it, we struggle to extend that love to others. Jews literally saw Gentiles as less, as worth, they were less human. They were worth less. And yet here Paul is putting them on the same level, indicating that God love, God's love not only extends to them, but it does so an equal amount. Look what he writes in verse 6 and 7. Paul says, and this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body. Both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Jesus Christ. By God's grace and mighty power, I've been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Now, by the way, this, these two verses are really, really good news to everybody in this room because we're technically all Gentiles, okay? You have to understand what was happening. God was opening the gospel to everyone. Now listen, if you pause and you think about what that means for you, when I think about what the grace of God means for me, who I was before he saved me, I am overwhelmed with gratitude and humility. But here's the thing. The problem isn't accepting it for me. The problem is the everyone part. Let me ask you a tough question. What do you do when everyone includes someone you think it shouldn't? Let, let me ask that again. What do you do when everyone includes someone you think it shouldn't? Because like it or not, there's probably a line for you. When we think about God's love and who it's for, like some of you have friends and family members and coworkers that you really care about. When you talk to them, you can literally feel the emptiness in their lives. And you, know, you watch people that you love trying to fill their lives with what the world says matters. And so they're, you know, they try to buy their happiness or they try to you know, drink a little more or do a little more drugs or have a little more sex. You'll please yourself any way that you can. And we know what's missing in their lives and we know they desperately need Jesus and we know they don't know about his love. They don't know about his compassion. They don't understand his grace and mercy. They don't know about the power of the cross and the freedom available. Or if they do, they're holding it at arm's length. Those are the people that we want God's grace for. They're the people our hearts break for. But what about those we don't want his grace for? What if they've done something wrong? What if they've said something wrong? What if they are something wrong? What if they're part of a group that you were taught was the enemy? What if they're a different political party or gender or race or culture? What if they're making ungodly lifestyle choices? What if they're part of a different religion? What if they're undocumented immigrants? What if there's someone who offended you? Paul says, God called me to love the others. He has called us to extend the boundaries of his love far beyond where our minds want to assume they stop. Because here's the reality. I don't love like Jesus loves. I mean, how many of you can admit that to yourself? That you don't love like Jesus. That you don't love like you should. That God called us to love more than the world. And sometimes the church is guilty of doing the opposite. Sometimes the church is guilty of loving less. Of being the most critical, the most judgmental voices. What's it going to take to love more? That's what I want to talk about. So here's what I think it takes. Number one, we need more compassion. We need more compassion. I read a book recently on restorative therapy. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? Um, that book claimed that fundamental to all our issues in life is our search for the answer to two questions. Number one, the question of trustworthiness. Am I safe? Number two, the question of love. Am I chosen? When you live in this world and you do not feel safe and you do not feel loved or chosen, guess what? Your, ten your tendency is going to be to do things that seem unlovable. In other words, those who tend to be the hardest to love are probably the ones who need love the most. Jesus showed us his life and his death, in his life and his death, just what is meant by compassion. Like he, 
he caught that, this woman, this, he loved this woman who was caught in adultery. He didn't let her off the hook. He didn't ignore her sin, but he, show, he showered her with love and grace. He, but he also said, go and sin no more. He loved the blind, the lame, the diseased, those that society had cast aside, those that society had no time for. And he reached out and he loved them with compassion. And he tells those who follow him, those who claim his name, who say, I am a Christian, that we are to love others with the same kind of love. We are to love more. We are to love more than people deserve. Jesus sets no limits on how far our love should go. Willingness to give sacrificially of ourselves is actually the mark of a true disciple according to Scripture. We need more compassion. Compassion says, I see you. You need to see those different than you. We, we need to see the most broken and hurting and lost people not as a threat, but as a treasure. Not as undeserving, but as lost sheep. Not as an outsider or an enemy, but as if they were Jesus himself. In fact, in Matthew 25, verse 40, the king says this, I, I will tell you the truth when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. When you didn't love, you weren't loving me. And when you did, you were loving me. We need more compassion. The second thing we need, we need more communion. Now, communion is more than what we just shared in earlier. It's more than the bread and the cup. The implications of a life of communion with others are costly. Communion is about meeting people where they are and loving them just as they are with all of their limitations, with all of their brokenness. Communion is the ability to accept someone as they are, but beyond that, to see their inner beauty in the midst of hurt and pain. A great example for us is a ministry in our church that we are involved in called Safe Families for Children, where we actually open our homes uh, to, to you know, coach parents who are struggling and, and host, host kiddos in our homes during a tough season with people, and we choose to suspend judgment to lead with love despite the realities of these families' current situation. Compassion says, I see you, but communion says, I will walk with you. And that is something, I gotta, I gotta be honest, is not natural to us. It's something that we can easily have excuses not to do. This is not something that we in our own strength can do. And Paul realizes that and he picks up his prayer. In verse 14, he says this. When I think of all this, he says, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Now watch what he prays. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Listen, communion with others takes both his power and his love. Paul says, I'm driven to my knees in prayer. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal to us because we kneel to pray all the time. But in this time, in this day, people stood to pray. They put their faces towards heaven to pray. The only time they got on their knees to pray was when it was an expression of deep, deep emotion. Let me give you some examples. Solomon knelt at the dedication of the temple. Stephen knelt and prayed while he was being stoned to death for his faith. Paul knelt to pray during his farewells to his friends as he's headed to Jerusalem to die. Jesus knelt to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed, Father, if there's any way this cup can be removed from me and I not have to suffer, let it be, but not my will but yours be done. Those are the types of times we get on our knees. And it's with that same sense of urgency that Paul gets on his knees. He falls to his knees and he prays this, God, please help them love more. He says, may we be so rooted in God's love. Listen, if we're ever going to love like God loves, our lives need to be so rooted in his love, our, in the reality of his love in our lives. You'll never be able to love like Jesus if you haven't fully comprehended his love for you. And the picture of this is a great tree whose roots have gone down deep in the soil. When you are rooted in something, you are drawing your nourishment from that thing. It is your life. It is your food. It is your water. It is the very thing that sustains you. It is that which causes you to flourish. And Paul says, my, he drops to his knees in desperation. He says, God, my desire for the church is that we would be so plugged into your love that it would be our source of nourishment and it would give us the strength to love others well. Which leads to number three, we need more community. 
You hear us talk about community groups and push you all the time into community and into discipleship, one-on-one discipleship. Well, that's in part because of how life-giving it can be, but can I be honest? Community can also be a place of pain because community is a place of truth. It's a place of growth. See, compassion says, I see you. Communion says, I will walk with you, but community says, I will do life with you. To continue with our analogy of rootedness, roots not only need to be rooted in good soil, they also need to find strength in one another. When a tree is planted alone, its roots need to go down incredibly deep if it's going to survive. Otherwise, they're always susceptible to being uprooted. But when trees grow together, they can actually depend on each other for strength. Their, Their roots go deep, but they connect with one another. And that's the radical community that we're called to as believers. Think about redwood trees. Redwood trees grow hundreds of feet tall. Redwood trees have shallow root systems that intertwine with the roots around them. And so a 350 foot tall redwood may have roots that only go down five to 15 feet deep, but they branch out towards all the other trees and they interlock their roots for stability as well as the sharing of nutrients. Now listen, I'm not advocating not going deep into God. That's not what I'm saying. Christian maturity comes from time alone with God as our roots go deeper into him through the reading of scripture, through prayer, through, through time spent alone with him. But Christian maturity also happens in relationship as we spread out our roots and we interlock with other people through service and through community. Some Christians, they go deep into God, into his word, into prayer, but they do not live in community. That's not God's plan. Some Christians, they do community really well, but they don't go deep with God. That's not God's plan either, and both are dangerous. Listen, we are stronger when we're rooted deep in God, and we are stronger when we're rooted in community with one another. We're stronger when we worship together, and when we pray together, and when we eat together, and when we lean on one another, and when we open God's word together, and we serve in our communities together, and we share our hope and faith in the Lord together, and when we love each other, even when we disagree. We are called to love God with all that we are, but we are also called to love more than that, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And he claimed that all of Scripture, everything else we'll learn, hangs not on one, but on both of those commands. Love deeply, love more. Look at verse 18 and 19. Paul says this, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Paul says, may you be rooted in God's love, a love that is wide enough for everyone, a love that is longer than my list of sins, a a love that is higher than my imagination can stretch, a love that is deeper than the depths of darkness. He says, may you be rooted in that kind of love. And the word for love here is the word agape. It is a sacrificial word. It is the absolute, unselfish, other's first love. Agape is a decision. It's a decision to love even the unlovable. It is a love that is fixed. It is not fleeting. It is a love that is a daily choice, not an automatic feeling. It is a love that Christ showed to us, and it's a love that we as believers are called to show even the most unlovable people around us because the reality is you're unlovable too. C.S. Lewis puts his call to more in perspective in his book, The Four Loves. He wrote this, we are all receiving charity. There's something in all of us that cannot be naturally loved. You might as well ask people to like the taste of rotten bread or the sound of a mechanical drill as to expect that God would find something lovable in us. Please understand Your best attempt, Scripture calls filthy rags. To be loved by God is the ultimate act of charity. It's like the love my sister showed to Bobo. God seems to have love like that for us, flawed and broken, bent and tattered by life, but made beautiful, made beautiful by that love. And I think one of the greatest disservices we do to God is, first of all, the assumption that we somehow deserve his love, and, some, and then second, the assumption that somehow other people don't. How dare we? 
be so arrogant. Loving God, our call as believers is rooted in loving God more than anything else and loving the other as we love ourselves. We are to love, listen, we have to love more than the world loves right now. We have to. So that the world takes notice. They see Jesus in us. But the unspoken warning here is that when we fail to love when people outside of the faith, outside of the church, look at the church and they see something other than God's more love, when they look at God's church and they don't see that love, we misrepresent God because he is love. So in this series, we're wrestling with what our personal calling is. You were made to be more than you think you are. And you were also made to love more. More than you want to love others. So I want to leave you with this final verse from 1 John. It's one of my favorites. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says... Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is love. And so as we prepare to wrap up this morning, we're going to pray. And Phil talked just a little bit about prayer, that we stand when we pray, like that was the typical way to pray. So I would just like to invite you all to stand with me this morning. And I'll just say this at the same time as he talked about people standing for prayer. We learned how Paul knelt to pray and Jesus knelt to pray. Solomon knelt to pray in those moments where they were coming before God, begging for something. And so this morning, I'm not going to ask everybody to kneel, but I think there are maybe some of you that are thinking, I really need to be better at this love thing. I haven't loved the way that Jesus loves I haven't lived my life in a way that reflects that love. And I just am going to ask you to join me in kneeling as we pray this prayer, just begging him to lead us into that love and into that more that he has for us, that more love. So even now, if you want to kneel, if, you, if God is calling you to that, join me in kneeling. So Jesus, here we are before you this morning. Many of us on our knees. I know for some it's really hard like it is for me. I'm not sure I'm going to get up. <laughs> but I knew I needed to be here. First, Jesus, I just want to say I'm sorry. On behalf of myself and on behalf of others in this room, I'm sorry for the ways that I haven't loved others the way that I should. Jesus, I'm sorry for all the ways that I stop short. For every way that I know I'm supposed to love and I just still sometimes don't love. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive us for that, Jesus? And then as we're on our knees, we are asking you, to keep showing us how to love that way, how to live in community, how to be people that are full of compassion. Jesus, how to look like you when we love people, how to let our love have no boundaries, not depending on who anybody is or what they look like or how they act or how they make us feel. Let us still love them, Jesus. And we can trust you in that to lead us in the way that 
that we love and that we help people learn who you are so that they can grow in you as well and they can walk away from sin, but don't let their sin keep us from loving them. Jesus, will you let our love for one another and our love for others be something that draws people to you so that they can know you, so that they can grow, so that they can learn who you are. Thank you so much for that, Jesus. And this morning, I pray that for all of us. And Jesus, that as we go from this place, that we will be people that aren't afraid to proclaim your love to others, to share that love with all of the people around us, with the people that we're going to leave this place and go have lunch with or go to work with or see at the store, for the people that make us mad in the parking lot or for the person that frustrates us so badly at work, would you just teach us how to love Jesus, even in our families and with our friends and in our community groups? Thank you, Jesus. We want to be a people that love more. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. In your precious name we pray.